proverbial rope. It's when you've exhausted all possibilities and still things look like they just aren't going to work out. Back in 1979, I served the Church of the Shepherd. It's the church that I started. And after three years of meeting in a school, we were ready to build our first building. The architectural plans had been approved. The congregation was ready to take on the deck of the building. And I was so excited to get the building process started. There was just one problem. At that time, Iran was holding our embassy uh, captive, and interest rates were sky high. Prime rate was 20%. The gasoline lines were never ending. Remember that time? The problem we faced was that nobody wanted to loan the new church the money for the building, and I was devastated. I mean to say the chance of us getting a loan looked bleak. I remember calling our mom and telling her the news. She wouldn't allow herself to hold a pity party for me. Instead, she said, so you're at the end of your rope. Tie a knot, hang on to it, and remember that God has a hold of the other end. I thought about her words. Was she just plain Cinderella? By midweek, I received something in the mail from Mom. It was a plaque with a rope on it with two knots tied on the ends. And in the middle is a brass plate with the following inscription. End of my rope. B. Bulware. 7879. And here it is. <laughs> Do you think that's important? Yeah. That was on a Wednesday when I received her gift. On Friday, our trustee signed a contract for a loan for the entire amount with a local bank. That loan made that church possible. Possible. What does a preacher preach on his last Sunday sermon? Well, three months ago, I began to write some ideas down. You can get through anything in life that hands you, but you can, if you stay put in the day that you are in and don't jump ahead, that would have been a good thing. It's never too late to have a happy childhood, but the second one is up to you. Frame every so-called disaster with these words, in five years will this matter. God loves you because of who God is, not because of anything you did or didn't do. If we all threw all of our problems into a pile and got to look at everyone else's, we'd fight to get ours back. Get rid of anything that isn't useful, beautiful, or joyful. Life isn't tied with the world, but it's still a gift. All of those have possibilities, don't they? But none of them really jumped out at me. And so I did what I've been doing for years. When I get stumped, I go to the Scripture, and I let the Scripture find for me a sermon. And it did. It's the Sabbath. And Jesus is in the home which belongs to a Pharisee. Now, what does that look like? The Pharisees were the most argumentative people with Jesus all three years of his ministry. They were quite wealthy and well-to-do. They had nothing to know about the hardships of life of the poor and the sick and the neglected, the ones we call the least, the last, and the lost. And that's when a certain man was noticed by Jesus. He was very ill. <coughs> was an illness known at that time as dropsy. We really don't hear that term very often anymore, do we? Jesus looked at the man. He knew that the man wanted to be healed, but that was against Jewish law on the Sabbath. It was considered work, and work was not to be done on the Sabbath. 
After all, the man could be healed the next day. That would have worked. The Pharisees wouldn't have had trouble with that other than they would have been their usual envious of Jesus. But it didn't have to happen on the Sabbath. But Jesus healed the man then and there. And then he defended his actions. Now keep in mind that all of this happened in the house of the Pharisee, the very people who were the most argumentative with Jesus. Even the first verse tells us something where I read, One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. That's the first verse. Oh, they zeroed in on Jesus. They were watching him, his every move. Yes, the Pharisees were watching him. And the truth is, he had just broken one of the Sabbath laws. And the Pharisees were already keeping score. Now I ask you, what really did Jesus do in this short story? What is it that he did? Well, he had dinner at the house of a Pharisee. And that was unusual. He gave those watching Pharisees reason to get upset with him. He broke a Sabbath law. Something else Jesus did, he healed a man. All of these things are true, but Jesus did more than just these three things. As important as these three, three things are, he did something greater than that. He made life possible for the man who had been sick. And in doing so, Jesus made the man Possible. Possible. What is it that we're asked to do by Jesus? Go into any church in this community. We're all asked to do the very same things. We are asked to make something possible. And along the way, we end up making someone else possible. Let's face it. Jesus, by healing a sick man just made life possible for that man, didn't he? His whole life now has changed. It will not remain what it has been. He has a whole different outlook on life. And the possibilities of his life are now through the roof because he's well. When you think about it, that's what ministry is all about. In whatever church you are in, making things possible so that people can become more possible themselves. That's what a church is all about. Jesus was not going to get caught up in a debate over the Sabbath laws with the Pharisees. Oh, that's what they wanted. But Jesus didn't allow himself to be pulled into such an argument. There were more important things to do. Healing the sick man, making life for him more possible, making the man himself more possible. True story. A certain mother lived in Laguna Beach, California, and her daughter lived two hours away at Lake Arrowhead. For several years, the daughter had been asking the mother to come up to Lake Arrowhead to see the beautiful daffodils when they were in full bloom. Finally, the mother named Carolyn made time to visit. In her own words, Carolyn writes, after about 20 minutes, we turned onto a small gravel road and I saw a small church. And on the far side of the church, I saw a hand-lettered sign which read, the Daffodil Garden. We got out of the car and walked down a little path and then I looked up and gasped. Before me lay the most glorious sight that I've ever seen in my life. It looked as though someone had taken a great vat of gold and poured it down over the mountain peaks and slopes. It was incredible. The flowers were painted, planted in majestic swirling patterns. Great ribbons and wreaths of deep orange, white, lemon, salmon peak, saffron, and butter yellow. Each different. Colored variety was planted as a group, so it swirled and flowered 
like its own river of its own hue. There were five acres of flowers. But who has done this, Carolyn asked her daughter. She answered, one woman. She lives on the property. That's her house over there. So they walked over to the well-kept little A-frame house that looked so small and modest in the midst of all that glory. And on the patio, the women spotted a sign in red. Answers to the questions I know you're wanting to ask. The first answer is simple. 50,000 bulbs. The second answer is also incredible. It said, done by one woman, one at a time, two hands, two feet, and a bad back. And the third answer said, began in 1958. Giant trees don't appear instantly and overnight. And beautiful gardens don't appear instantly overnight either. And you know that same thing holds true for your life and for my life too. Sometimes the loan of a new church is trying to, that is trying to acquire doesn't happen overnight. So you tie a knot in a rope and hang on to it, trusting that God holds the other end. And sometimes it rains, and sometimes the sun shines brightly, and sometimes it storms, and sometimes it's absolutely gorgeous outside, and sometimes things go wonderfully well, and sometimes things go poor, poorly. But the real question is, what is it that your life is trying to make possible? And whose life will be made possible along the way? And I wonder what you might say as you respond to those two questions this morning. And here's the flip side of what I've said so far. There have been many people who have made you possible again and again and again. I think of my parents and my teachers and my grandparents and my sister and my brother-in-law and my children, and my friends, and my countless more in the churches that I have served who have helped make me possible. But if I turn around in my memory, I can see so many people who have been there for me in so many different ways, which have brought me to this very present moment in my life. And when I think of all those people, the ones who helped make me possible, I can only respond with a heart overflowing with gratitude. And you, this very congregation, just think back and remember how far you helped me become possible again. I came here a broken man, a divorced man, a wounded man. And today, I am healthy, happy and I'm whole. You helped make life possible once again for me and no one has done that more for me than Peggy. That's what God would have us do with each other. Make something possible for others so that they can become possible themselves. That's our mission. If anything explains life, our very existence, well, I think that's what it's meant to be. On the first day, God created the dog and said, sit all day by the door of your house and bark at anyone who comes in or walks past. For this, I will give you a lifespan of 20 years. The dog said, that's a long time for me to be barking. How about only 10 years and I'll give you back the other 10? So God saw that it was good. We're going to go home and begin cooking. <laughs> so God saw that it was good. On the second day, God created the monkey and said, Entertain people. Do tricks. Make them laugh. 
For this I'll give you 20 years of life. And the monkey said, monkey tricks for 20 years? That's a pretty long time for me to perform. How about I give you 10 years back like the dog? And God again saw that it was good. On the third day, God created the cow and said, you must go into the field with the farmer all day long and suffer under the sun and have calves and give milk to support the farmer's family. And for this, I will give your lifespan of 60 years. And the cow said, whew, that's kind of a tough life if you want me to live for 60 years. How about just 20 and I give you back the other 40? And God agreed and it was good. And on the fourth day, God created humans and said, eat, sleep, play, marry, enjoy your life. And for this, I will give you 20 years. But the human said, only 20 years? Could you possibly give me my 20? The 40 the cow gave back, the 10 the monkey gave back, and the 10 the dog gave back, and that will make me 80, okay? Okay, said God, you asked for it. So that is why for the first 20 years of your life, you eat, sleep, play, and enjoy yourself. For the next 40 years, you slave in the sun to support your family. For the next 10 years, you do monkey tricks to entertain the grandchildren. And for the last 10 of years, you just sit on your porch and bark at the people as they go by. <laughs> Life has now been explained to you. <laughs> but not really. What does explain our purpose in life is to make life for others more possible. And to do that in Jesus' name. God was calling the great prophet Jeremiah into the ministry. But he didn't want to go. Trust me, I remember how that felt. And finally God said, Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. What a profound statement. But God can declare that very same thing about you, all of us, here this morning. For you see, it really is God who makes you possible and me possible. To be sure, we help make each other possible, as we have said along the way. But even more, it is God's doing. At some point, we must face this one important question. And I wish that I could tell you who authored this, but I can't. I shared it about eight years ago. Are we human beings who happen to be having a spiritual experience? Or are we spiritual beings who happen to be having a human experience? Think about that for just a moment. Because it's a very important question. Most people would probably say that we're human beings who happen from time to time to have a spiritual experience, meaning that basically our lives are framed by our birth on one hand and our death on the other hand, and that in between we happen from time to time to have spiritual experiences. But I think the Bible would say exactly the opposite from that, that we are spiritual beings who happen to be having a human experience. In other words, our lives didn't begin on the day that we were born and they don't end on the day that we die. That's such a short little time span and our lives are so much bigger than that. No, our lives began way back there millions of years ago, long before there was a planet or a star or even a universe way back there when there was only God. For you see, and this is the important part, way back then, we existed in God's mind, 
and in God's heart. We were known by him and we were loved by him and he already had a purpose for us and for our lives. And then when the time was right, God implanted us in our mother's womb with the help of our fathers and nurtured us there for nine months and then breathed into us the breath of life and we became a spiritual being with a living soul who happened to be in human bodies. To put all of that differently, our lives are much bigger than most of us have ever thought and our lives are much more profound than most of us have ever considered. And that's why we should always be a source of encouragement for each other, making things, good and wonderful things, possible for other people so that they can be themselves possible for the people around them. And it is by the power and the presence of Jesus Christ that we are able to do such things. And none of this is unintentional. For this is what God would have us do. And some of our possibilities take time, even a long time, like planting five acres of daffodils. And some of our possibilities require us to wait, like a mother's reminder, to tie a knot on the end of a rope and to hold on to it, believing that God has a hold of the other end. But all of it always is under the direction and the purpose and plans that God has for us. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were even born, I consecrated you. And he whispers in your soul and in my soul each and every day, let's make something possible today. Let's make someone possible today, together. When God whispers like that, it leaves us yearning for more of Him. You see, I truly believe that there is a yearning in each one of us why? Because we're spiritual beings, not just human beings. Each one of us can say about our own spiritual self, there's a yearning in me, hidden in my size, too deep for words. There's so much I don't understand or even perceive, but it's there, all there, feelings, hopes, intuitions, longings, and it all comes together when I sigh. There's a yearning in me to believe that the universe is held together at the center, that there is a God somewhere in the whirling galaxies upon whom I can hang my hat and pin my hopes, a yearning in my restlessness that will not rest, a yearning in the meaningless rat race to be and to stand, a yearning to reach through all the walls of death and hate to shake hands with life and love, a yearning to belong, to create, to participate, to feel valued from the core of my creation. A yearning to sing in tragedy and through death the praise of life. There's a yearning in me to let my sighs lengthen into songs cascading through creation, ricocheting off of the stars and echoing in human hearts and resounding in my heart with a joyous Amen. I believe each one of us has a yearning like that in us. And why? Because we're more than just human beings who every once in a while happen to have a spiritual experience. We are more than that. We are spiritual beings, long designed, long thought out, long loved, even before conception, by a creator God, a savior God, if you will. God who knew us and consecrated us even before we were born. And our job is to help make each other possible.
possible along God's plans. We really are spiritual beings who share this human experience together, making life possible for each other and trusting a God who knew us long before we were born. Thank you for allowing me to share that God whom I passionately love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for all these years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.